Radio Church, good to be with you today, uh, last weekend of 2020, which in some ways seems crazy, like the year's gone really fast and really slow at the same time, and so uh, this is a, a kind of a staple for me in my 15 years here at Radiant. I've spoke many times on the last weekend of the year. It's uh, a holiday pastor tradition, but it is always a huge honor and privilege to be able to do that, and uh, as Pastor Zach said, I hope you had a blessed Christmas with your family and, and your friends and your loved ones, and um, we we're, we're really are excited for what 2021 has to bring, and sometimes in these uh, times and in this particular service, it's easy to look and say, okay, well, let's, let's just talk about 2021, and, and let's leave 2020 behind and, and move forward, and of course, there is something to that. Normally, I would be up here talking about New Year's resolutions, which I've done. Uh, in the past, you don't want to brag, but last year I was like, I'm going to lose 10 pounds, and I only have like 17 more to go, so I'm on a roll <laughs> practically there, and uh, then I'll, I'll say, hey, who can finish a chap? I've said over the years, like, can you finish a chapstick? That's a New Year's resolution. I literally get like videos and pictures of people who are like, I finished, and I'm assuming they're lying because it's impossible to do, but they finish their chapsticks, and so I'm not, I'm not going to do that uh, this year. I figure New Year's resolutions, they go in one year and out the other. Am I right? Oh, see what I did there? Tough crowd. Tough crowd. Whew. I will tell this story. So if I was going to make a New Year's resolution for me, it would be, John, get better at directions. So I don't know about you. I'm somewhat directionally challenged, but it's easier because we have phones and we have navigation and things. So I just went on a week's trip to Florida with my family. It was amazing. We just got back. Uh, a, f a week or so ago. We went from Friday to Friday. We got there. Our flight left at 6 a.m., so we were in Florida by 9 a.m. on a Friday, and then I milked that thing. Our flight didn't leave till like 6.13 p.m. on Friday. So we check out. I'm like, let's go to the pool. It's like 64 degrees, but who cares? It's sunny. Uh, and we had plenty of time, right, to get to the airport. Let's go. Let's go grab Chick-fil-A on the way. So we're all piling into my, I don't want to brag again, but my Infiniti QX80 that I got upgraded to instead of a minivan. So I only paid for a minivan, but the, yeah, thank you. Uh, and then I told my family, like, hey, you know, nothing's too good for you guys, honestly, you know. I upgraded, even though I didn't pay a dime. Uh, and so we dropped the car off. We got all our stuff. We're like an hour and a half early. It's, it's 20 after 4 or something like that. We go into the airport, and I'm not seeing any signs for like Allegiant air at all. No, no way of determining that they even exist at this point. So I'm a little concerned. And I go to the help desk and she's like, yeah, they don't fly here. I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> apparently they're, you know, like, again, I put the airport into my phone. We're good. And, and apparently there's an Orlando international airport and there's an Orlando Sanford airport. And I needed to be in Sanford, and I was not in Sanford. So I had to tell Kendra, my beautiful wife, like, uh, we're at the wrong airport. And that went well. And so <laughs> I'm like, we can make it. Like, I'm a seven on the Instagram. I'm an optimist. We're go let's go. Let's run right now. All the kids, like, boom. But she's like, we already turned in the car. I'm like, I know. I will tell them. And so I go, and they're like, yeah, we already processed it, but here we can get you a minivan, and we'll only charge you taxes and something like that. So we were in the car and in the minivan, and I'm, of course, going 70 miles an hour flat. No speeding whatsoever. I'm kidding. I'm going like 110 in that thing. I'm like, we're going to make it. And Kendra's like, we're never going to make it. I'm like, quiet, woman. And faith is rising despite the environment that I'm in. And we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Kids, start praying. And uh, we're 45 minutes away from the, from the airport uh, that we need to be at, right? And so it's about 4.30. <laughs> Flight leaves at 6.11. And so we're going, we're going, we're going. We get there. I drop the kids off. Like, get out and tell them. And then just if I don't make it, I love you. And I park the car. And I leave the minivan. And I'm running. And I have a mask on. And I'm out of shape so bad, and I'm carrying my carry-on luggage, and uh, Kendra's like on the way, we need a contingency plan at least. I'm like, the plan is we're going to make this flight, and we made the flight. Uh, we get there, we get there, and, and like the plane's pulling out, and I jump off the jet. Now, that's a lie. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, okay. That didn't happen. The rest did, though, uh, and I was like, see, we're good. We're sure we're the last ones on there. We just strolled on like, what's up, y'all? Let's go. <laughs> And uh, we made our flight. So my New Year's resolution is to be more 
attentive to details, I guess, especially <laughs> when I'm around Kendra. Uh, so there you go. Five minute story. I feel like we could probably close the service, but we'll go a little further. Let's pray. We'll pray, and then if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 15. Father, we ask that in these next few moments you would speak to us through your word. We're so grateful uh, for your grace, a God that meets us every single morning. Holy Spirit, you know the needs of every single person that's listening, wherever they are. You're aware and attentive to their circumstances, and I pray that you would illuminate your word and what's spoken into every single heart. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Romans chapter 15. I'm going to read a couple verses out of uh, verse starting in verse 14. This is obviously the Apostle Paul writing to the church, and he says this, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you are filled with goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me. I've called this last sermon in 2020 by way of reminder. Paul's writing to the church and he says some good things about them. He commends them. He says, I'm encouraged by what I see. I'm encouraged by what you're doing. I'm encouraged by who you are. The same thing I would say to Radiant Church. So encouraged as we've come through 2020 by the way that we've rallied together and we've pressed into the Lord and we've seen the goodness of God through some very difficult circumstances. And so Paul is commending them. And then he says, but on some points I've written to you very boldly to be a way of reminder because of the grace given to me and begins to talk to them about how the gospel is for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And that phrase just stuck out to me by way of reminder. We know a reminder is not something new necessarily. It's not brand new information. A reminder is literally bringing to the forefront something that you already know. Maybe you've forgotten, maybe you haven't thought about it in a while, but it's something you're aware of already, but you need a reminder. We set reminders in our phones, you know, feed the cat or pay the cable bill or something so that we're reminded of something. And I felt like the Lord wanted to use me this weekend to help remind you of some things in your life, of some things that God is doing, and of some things that we may already know, but sometimes in the difficulties and in the seasons especially a year like 2020, we don't always keep it on the forefront and we need to be reminded of some of those things. So I'm gonna give us three things that I felt like the Lord wants to remind us of as we go into 2021. And the first thing is this, that God is in control. God is in control. If you're super holy right now, you're already thinking of Twilight Paris and humming it to yourself. Raise your hand if that's you. God is in control. There's only three saved people in here? That is crazy. We believe that your promise will never be shared. There is no power above or beside you. We know. Yeah. Man, that seemed better today when I was practicing. God is in control. Okay, fine. Twilight Paris, great song. I'm sorry if you don't like 90s music. That's your problem. It's amazing. Anyway, she says, God is in control. And I feel like, again, that's something we know. That's something we're aware of. It might even sound like kind of like Christian jargon or, or pastor talk. God's in control. But I believe to the core of my being that it is a reminder that we need to have as followers of God that he is still on the throne. He is still reigning and ruling. The circumstances we see around us are not an indicator that God's detached, that God is unaware, or that God is incapable of controlling what happens. God is not up in heaven wringing his holy hands He's not nervous. He's not putting fingers in the, Jesus, give me a hand over here. It's falling apart. He's in control. Listen to Psalm chapter two. It says, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up. The rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. And they say, let us break their chains, throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs, he holds them in derision, he holds them in contempt, he's in the heavenly places and he is still in control. And I just want us to be aware that no matter what happens around us, no matter what happens in a year like 2020, it is still 
incumbent upon us as believers to not be shaken, to not look to circumstances, to not have a a mindset where we become apathetic or fearful or bury our heads in the sand. We have to remember that God is in control. Let me just give you a quick rundown of 2020, and this is just kind of from memory. It's not like I did a search, but most of you will remember these things that happened. I remember in January, there was the Australian bushfires that took place, like unprecedented damage in the continent of Australia. Fires galore, I'm watching the Australian open, and that's a big deal. Then on the cusp of that, the Me Too movement is launched. Remember that, it exposed some of the sexual brokenness in our culture. And I remember Hollywood was kind of pointing the finger, if you will, at the Catholic Church and some of the abuses that happened there, and then all of a sudden, Hollywood realizes, wow, there's some Harvey Weinsteins in our midst, and maybe our hands aren't as clean as we thought, and then people are coming forward and talking about situations at work and situations that they've gone through, and all of this is, is being exposed in this moment. Then we see business leaders and, and even religious leaders that are falling morally, and there's this pain that's unearthed through this movement. And then literally on the heels of that, that's like February, March, a pandemic of unprecedented proportions. We hear the words COVID-19 for the first time, social distancing becomes a thing, stay home orders, lockdowns, no toilet paper, no bread, no food, no, I mean, it's just this crazy dynamic that no one's ever seen or been a part of. And then in the midst of that, maybe the worst stain on our nation's history once again raises its ugly head through racial injustice, and we have the George Floyd killing and we have the protests and we have the riots and we have the all of the tension and pain that goes along with that in exasperated by this pandemic we find ourselves in and we're all watching the team we're all just what is going on and then we step into a political season that's heated to say the least massive divide in our country red and blue right and left and That's not even mentioning some of the other things that didn't make as much news. Murder hornets and impeachments, right? The deaths of Kobe Bryant and Ruth Bader Ginzer and Alex Trevor. I mean, just a crazy year. And it's sometimes a temptation to look at it and to think things can't get much worse. What's really happening? Let's just hunker down and, and, and say Maranatha and wait for the Lord to come and, and, and because this is as bad as it's gonna get. And I'm here to tell you, this isn't as bad as it's gonna get. I'm here to tell you that in our lowest moments, in our seasons and times where we think it's the worst, we think we're the weakest, we think nothing's happening, those are the times that God is moving the strongest and God is moving in those valleys and he is making Beauty from ashes. And I'm telling you that that is what I believe America is positioned for. I have hope for America right now in the name of Jesus. I have hope that God is going to move as he has in the past. There are people who will say, look, the church, the church is, let's let's just be honest, it's in decline. Its best days are behind it. It used to maybe have, you know, I don't know, way back, name a year, way back when we, we had some momentum. But now let's, we're losing our influence. We're losing our buildings. We're becoming clubs and condos. And, and the church just isn't what it used to be. And, and it's in this like steady decline. Let me tell you, you look at history, both in the Bible and in, in the world. There's never been a moment where the church has been in steady decline. That's not how it works. What you do see is almost like a wheel turning and these different seasons of the church's history that are being exposed through time and space. So what generally happens is there's a relationship with God. God's people have fellowship with him and they're in community with him. And then there's an apathy. There's something that takes place. We begin to be pulled away in other directions. And then from there, there begins to be an unraveling of culture an unraveling of people. The morals begin to decay in a people group. And then that leads to a time of dark degradation and shame among people. That's what you see in scripture. That's what you see in the book of Judges. It's not this like gradual thing. It's like a wheel that turns, but always in those moments, always there is a remnant. There is a people who begin to pray and begin to seek God and begin to say, have mercy on us. And God from heaven reaches down and he brings his presence and he brings his goodness and seeds of revival are sown in the darkest moments. And I'm telling you, that's what we need to believe 
about 2020 is that God is working and God is moving and it's in those valley seasons that God does what only God can do when our our eyes are taken off ourselves, taken off our own resources and our own solutions and we say, God, you're all we have, but you're all we need. It's not just in the Bible. You look at, and I'll just be very brief, but you look in the 1800s, it's not that long ago. The Industrial Revolution that happened in Britain. Cities were populated, middle class was formed, all of a sudden there's all this, this wealth that had never been seen before, and it, it looked like it was good, but it was all made on the backs of the poor and the backs of children. So children were literally pulled from homes, pulled from churches, and used in, in, in labor camps, and used to create things for people to consume. And the moral unraveling of the nation of Great Britain began to take place in Europe, and it got very dark, but God's people began to cry out. They began to say, Lord, have mercy on us. Save our nation. Men like John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, stood up, and he preached repentance, and he preached turning back to God, and people weren't like, yeah, preach it, John. They threw bricks at him. They threw dead cats at him. It's a true story. People died at the gatherings, but he kept preaching, and people started believing, and their hearts were turned back towards God, and God turned their hearts towards the people who were hurting, because that's what God does in us and in the church, and suddenly they saw these children being exposed, and they said, this isn't right, and labor laws for children were created. The Sunday school movement was launched, where the church said, it's not right that these children don't have anywhere to go. We'll take them in. We'll teach them to read. We'll teach them to write, and we'll teach them that there's a God who knows them. And loves them. And then young men used to get off work and they'd go straight to the bars, straight to the brothels. And the church, instead of wagging their finger at the, the culture, said, no, let's do something about this. Let's pray. And the YMCA was created. And the YWCA was created by the church so that these men could have somewhere to go, somewhere to spend their time, somewhere to be discipled, somewhere to work out. Let's play pickleball for Jesus. Literally, the church moved. And the crown jewel in this movement was there began to be prison reform. The way that the mental, people with mental health issues was, were, were treated was changed. And then a man named William Wilberforce, who was part of the Britain's parliament, he was in government, he said there's an evil among us called slavery and these African brothers and sisters have every bit the identity of God that we do. And he fought against human trafficking and he fought against slavery every day for 30 years and there began to be a change, a movement, a seed of revival in that nation. And 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. And the exact same God of 2 Chronicles 7.14 is standing in the gap in 2020 saying, if my people will pray and seek my face, I will hear. And revival can happen in the United States of America if we believe that God is on the throne. Amen? Amen. All right. We're good. We're good. God is on the throne. Don't, don't be that person who's always negative, who's always looking at what's going on and what's wrong. No, we can't do that as believers. We can't sit in church and sing songs like, I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Oh, God, look who's president. We're doomed. Like, we can't do that. We can't sit in, 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 in our chairs and sing the songs and not believe it. We either believe Psalm 46 or we don't. Let me just read it to you. Just listen to this, and I'll, I'll get off this point. It says, our God is a refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Listen, come and see, they said, what the Lord has done. The desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. 
I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God is in control. Second thing I want to remind us of is this, and I'll be very brief. The words that we speak are powerful. The words you speak are powerful, and I feel like, again, we need to be reminded. Hopefully we know this. But every time that we voice something, say something, or speak something, we're literally directing and creating our futures and, and what we want to see happen around us. But many times, we don't put the value or the power on our words that we need to as Christians. Sometimes it's funny when kids say words wrong. I was thinking about it, and I remember, I can't remember which daughter of mine, but when she would say the alphabet, she would say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and then I swear she said armadillo P. Um, and I was just like, that's amazing. You can learn the alphabet any way you want. And then Eric, just recently, I have it on video, was saying we have these Zonervan family like values that we say uh, each week to each other. And so his was uh, that we're generous. And so it's 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. Simple verse to memorize. So he's got, you know, he's doing this thing. We are generous people. We are generous with our time, our talents, and our treasure. 2 Kardashian 9, 7. And I was like, oh, dear God, no. You're going to get me fired. Please tell me that's not a translation. And Kendra and I are trying not to laugh. as he's, and, and it's funny, but I'm telling you, our words are powerful. Our words have weight and depth, and they are a reflection of what's in our heart and what is happening around, what we want to see happen. Proverbs 18, verse 21, write this down. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Listen to the message translation. It's simple. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or they're fruit. You choose. Your words are not neutral. Your words are not by accident. What you're saying and what you're speaking are literally framing the direction you want your life to go. And I'm, I'm not talking about, hey, we should be nice and we shouldn't call each other names or we shouldn't say a swear word. I don't, that's great. I'm, I'm for all that. I'm a words of affirmation guy. It's my love language. I tell Kendra, you don't have to buy me things. Just tell me how great I am and we'll be fine, Right? That's, I'm for all of that, but what I'm saying more than just, oh, try to be nice to people and, and try to just, you know, keep, keep your language clean. More than that, I'm saying, what are you prophesying? What are you speaking into your future, into your family, and into the world around us for what God wants to do? Two things I want to remind you of. First is that your words create. Your words literally create. Genesis 1-3 says this, God said, spoke. Let there be light, and there was light. We are made in the image of God. If God's words are powerful, our words are powerful, and they create. They create life, or they create death. They create good things, or they create bad things. And I know sometimes this whole kind of like what we say has gotten wrapped up in the name it, claim it, and, and you know, I want a Porsche, and I want a pony, and that's, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. It's unfortunate that that's kind of been hijacked in some maybe charismatic realms, but I cannot overstress to us as Christians that just like God spoke order into chaos, God spoke light into darkness, as we step into 2021, we must, this is not a time for careless words. This is not a time for us to be flippant with what we say. We must speak life into chaos, order into chaos, and light into darkness with our words. We're creating with our words. There's tons of scriptures I could give you. Read all of James chapter three. Job 22 talks about you declare a thing, it will be established for you. I said Proverbs 18, but look, listen to Luke chapter six. This is Jesus. He says, for no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are gathered from thorn bushes, nor are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. Listen to verse 45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's the second thing. Your words create. Your words are an overflow of what's in your heart. So the words that you're saying are a direct reflection of what's already in your heart. 
And so if the words you speak are not life, if they're always negative, if it's always, my marriage will never get better, I'll always be broke, my kids aren't going, if that's what you're saying, I'm just telling you that's what's in your heart. So more than trying to guard what we say, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flow the issues of your life. What are you putting into your heart? Sometimes we want to get the, the low-hanging fruit. Like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I shouldn't. Have. It's no. What's, what's coming out is what's going in. It's a process. And so in 2021, let me just say it as plainly as I can. Let God's word enter your heart in a way that it hasn't before. Let the word of God be the mainstay of what you feed on and what you focus on. Because if what's coming out of your mouth isn't lining up with God's word, it's because that's what's not going in your heart. And we live in a day where it's so easy to let what goes into our hearts be the 24-hour news cycle. You know that before 1980, there was no news cycle? It was 5 o'clock news, 6 o'clock news, that's it. Then CNN launched in 1980, and since that time, there are like 300 24-hour news channels. And we stand in front of that, and we just let it scroll. Or it's social media, or it's all of these things that aren't necessarily bad, but they can't be the mainstay of what goes in your heart, because that's what's going to come out of your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So put God's word into your mouth. Put God's word into your heart, and it will come out of your mouth. You remember when Satan tempted Jesus? Every time, his response was, it is written. This is what the Bible, this is what it says. Man shall not live by bread alone. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He didn't lean on his own intellect. He didn't lean on his, his own identity as I'm the son of God. He spoke the truth of God's word because that's what was in his heart. And I'm telling you, as you enter this next year, feed on God's word. Feed on God's faithfulness. I want to read to you again. I'm going to let you into my morning Call it rituals. I'm just going to read these. These are things that I say in the morning. I have my kids saying them now. They're all based out of God's word. And you can think, that's so weird. I think saying the word of God out loud is one of the most powerful things you can do. I'm all for reading to yourself, praying to yourself. But there's something about speaking into existence. So I wake up and I say this. Today I wake up with purpose, direction, and meaning. Every day of my life. Jesus is first in my life. I exist to serve and glorify him. I love my wife and I will lay down my life to serve her. My children will love God and serve him with their whole hearts. I will nurture, equip, train, and empower them to do more for his kingdom than they can imagine. I love people and I believe the best about others. I am disciplined. Christ in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. I'm growing closer to Jesus every day. Because of Christ, my family is closer, my body is stronger, my faith is deeper, and my leadership is sharper. I am anointed, empowered, equipped, and called to reach people that are far from God. I am driven, focused, and blessed beyond measure because the Holy Spirit dwells within me. And the world will be different and better because I serve Jesus today. I say that out loud over my, I don't always feel it. I'm not always seeing it. That's not necessarily what's dominating even my thoughts, but there is power in what you say. And when you line it up with God's word, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Two things I want to remind you of. That the words that you speak are powerful. God is in control. And the last thing is this, your past doesn't have to determine your future. As we enter into 2021, there's so many people, and I know it's different for everyone, but have had an awful year, lost loved ones, lost jobs, maybe lost hope. And one of the main tactics the enemy uses is guilt and shame and condemnation. That's what he loves to do, that's his arena. And he'll come in and say, this isn't ever going to happen for you. You've gone too far. You messed up. The marriage is over. Your kids got taken away. Your job is whatever it is. The, the thing you were going to do, your resolutions, you can't keep them. The same addictions you're struggling with. The same issues that you said this was going to be the year. They're not. They're still there. But so often the enemy wants you to be identified by the things that you've done or the things that have happened in your past. And I want to remind you. I feel the Holy Spirit wants to remind you, your past does not 
determine your future. Listen to what David prayed. I love this in Psalm chapter three. He's being chased by Absalom, his own son. He's jacked up his whole family. He's been a terrible father. He's made poor decisions. And he says, Lord, how they've increased who trouble me. Many are those who rise up against me. Many are those who say of me, there's no help for him. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. Satan wants you to hang your head in shame and guilt and in condemnation. Jesus says, I'm your shield, I'm your reward, and I'm the lifter of your head. Do not allow the enemy to dictate your future by what's happened in your past, good or bad. It could have been a great year for you, I don't know, but it's the manna principle. That is good for that day. What are we believing for in the next day? But many of us enter into new seasons and into new years, and we can't seem to let go of the past, let go of the pain, let go of the hurts, let go of the mistakes that we've made. And I feel the Holy Spirit just saying to you, I'm not remembering your wrongs. I'm not identifying by what you've, you by what you've done, but by who you are. You're a child of the King. I love you, I'm for you. Romans eight says nothing, not your sin, not demons in hell, nothing can separate you from the love of God. That's in Christ Jesus. That's what God wants you to hear. There's a passage I want to just read quickly. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I think this is so powerful. Paul's writing the church, and he says, Let no one deceive himself, verse 18. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, and they're futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God. I was reading this and look what stood out to me, saying, okay, these things are yours. You know, whatever you learn from Paul or Apollos or, you know, the, the world, the life, like we have some ownership of those things. And then he says, things present and things to come belong to you. They're yours. Notice what's missing from that list, your past, because that was paid for, and that belongs to God, and he doesn't see you through that lens. He sees you through the finished work of his son, Jesus. The present, yes, press into God. Your future, for sure, believe God for what he has for you. Your past, that belongs to God. He paid for it, and you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new because of who he is and what he's done. Last thing is this, God always has the final word. Always. First Samuel, or I'm sorry, the book of Judges, Samuel wrote it, it's a very colossally depressing book. Uh, I don't recommend it for your quiet time. <laughs> It's terrible, it's a book of cycles where people, the people of God knew God, failed miserably, did terrible things, God raised up judges to try to bring them back to himself, it literally happens like 10 times. You know some of the judges, Deborah and, and Gideon, and Samson is by far the most famous of all of these judges. And I just wanna highlight a few things in his life, and, and this will be the last thing that I share. But Samson, we know the story, he's strong, right? He's a Nazarene, and so his mom has a vision from an angel and says, you're gonna have a son, she's barren, and this is crazy, and they say, "This what, no strong drink, so touch his lips, and don't ever cut his hair. Those are the requirements that you need, and so Samson grows up, and he's strong, and he doesn't really know it right away, but he's walking, and a lion attacks him, which happens a lot, let's be honest, and uh, he tears it apart with his bare hands, and so in that moment, he was like, all right, got something going here. <laughs> the Lord's come upon me. This is good. I feel this. I feel God, right? And then he has a, 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 an issue, and he says, you know, I, I want to marry this Philistine girl, and his parents are like, can't you just get off Tinder? No, I'm just kidding. Say that. Can't you meet a girl that, that's from Israel? Can you, I mean, can you please? And they're like, no, I want her. And so he has these interactions with the Philistines, and he is a thorn in their flesh big time. Like he's, he has, kills a bunch of them with foxtails he tied together and lit on fire. He kills a bunch of them with a, a donkey jawbone, and, and, and they hate him. 
Like he keeps doing all these things to him. Well, then he meets Delilah. You guys know the story. How many of you know not many parents name their children Delilah? This is my daughter Delilah, her, her sister Jezebel. Like you don't ever, you don't hear, those aren't popular names. And there's a reason for that. Delilah doesn't have a good reputation, but Samson has some weakness, some areas in his life that he hasn't completely surrendered to the Lord and he's drawn in by this woman. And the Philistines go to her and they bribe her. And they say, hey, we want you to find out from Samson who we hate, how he gets his strength, how we can subdue him, and what would be the best way to kill him. So I want you to just hear this. So she goes, all right. So verse six says, so Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound so that one could subdue you. How many of you know that that's not a very good pickup line, right? I mean, <laughs> I haven't dated in a long time. I've been married for a while, but I feel like Samson should have realized at that point, hey there, Delilah, this isn't probably working for me. So, but he goes along with it and he says, well, you know, if they tie me up with seven, I don't know why Samson sounds like Rocky Balboa, but he does in my world. If they tie me with seven fresh bowstrings, I'll be as weak as any man. So he goes to sleep and he wakes up and he's tied with seven fresh bowstrings. Now again, you would think Samson would have an understanding like, hey, this isn't good, you know? Delilah, maybe we got to take some time off. I tell you what would make me weak. I wake up and that's exactly what happened. But he snaps them and he kills the Philistines who are trying to attack him that were undercover and, and, and she's upset. She says, you didn't tell me, you lied to me. Okay, okay, fine. You tie me up with seven ropes. They've never been used. You know, I'll be. So she does that. He wakes up. He's tied with seven ropes. Shh. Snaps them off, kills the Philistines. And then she says, you, you don't love me. How can you say you love me? You're lying to me. You won't give me your whole heart. And the Bible says, so he gave Delilah his heart. There's a whole nother message there. And he tells her, I've never had my hair cut. I'm a Nazarite. It's the source of my strength. He falls asleep and she shaves his head while he's sleeping and says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And it says, and he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as I have at other times and shake myself free. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. And so this was a different scenario for Samson. He's been used by God. He feels God. He knows there's a call of God on his life, but he hasn't done the things that he needs to do. He hasn't, maybe he's been as serious about it. He's had some pitfalls and some moral failures in his life. And look at verse 21 of Judges 16, I think they have it on the screen. It says, and the Philistines this time seized him, gouged out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. So they literally gouge his eyes out. He's blind. They put him on a mill and he just walks around grinding. This is his life in shackles and in chains. He's at his lowest moment. He's got to be reminiscing about, man, why did I make those mistakes? Why did I do those things? Why wasn't I this? Why did I do that? And look at verse 22. I'm telling you the truth. I read this every single year at the end of the year, this story, verse 22. But the hair of Samson's head began to grow again after it had been shaved. The source of his strength began to grow again. Jesus has the final word. I don't know what your 2020 has brought. I don't know what levels of difficulty you've had to reach, you've had to breach, you've had to overcome. I don't know what things have tried to define you from your past. I don't know if you're struggling with shame or guilt or condemnation or you feel exposed or naked or bald, but I tell you this, Jesus has the final word. The hair on your head will begin to grow. Again, the call of God on your life isn't over because you failed, because you missed it, because you sinned. The enemy wants to come in and say, God can never use you. I tell you, find me one person in the Old Testament that didn't have massive issues that God used. Every single one. God's not looking for perfection. He's looking for the pursuit of your heart to line up with his. And Samson had a moment where he called on the Lord and God used him one more time. And, and, and I say this to say that no matter where you are on your journey, it's not over until God says that it's over. And as we step into a new year, let new faith, new hope, like we sang about, 
Come into your heart. Come into your life. Come into your situation. Micah 7, verse 8. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It says this. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. For though I fall, I'll rise again. And though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light unto me. If you guys stand up with me, I just want to pray. I want to just pray over you and for you and ask the Lord to just speak to your heart. Listen, I, I prayed before this message, but I don't know everybody's situation. I don't know what you're going through, what your struggles are, what things the Holy Spirit hopefully highlighted. But I'm just going to ask you to just close your eyes and just let me pray for you. And then you, in this next week, there's whatever amount of days left before 2021, just begin to seek the Lord for next year. Begin to seek the Lord for what he has for you, your family, your future. There's power in the surrender, saying, God, not my will but yours be done. Not my ways but yours be done. There's power in giving God your heart. That's all he asks for. He's not asking you to clean yourself up. He's not asking you to try harder. He's not asking you to get it together. He's saying, can you surrender to me? Can you give me your heart and let me lead you and guide you into truth? So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person who's watching, who's listening, that, Father, you would meet them where they are. That, God, you, you run towards us. God, I, I see you just like the prodigal son. You're not tapping your foot. You're not wagging your finger. You're not waiting for us to come to you. You're running after us, God. You're pursuing us because that's who you are. And even our weak hearts woo you, God. Even our weak glance, Father, it moves your heart towards us. And I pray that every single person would understand the identity they have as a son and a daughter, that they don't have to strive. They don't have to work. They don't have to wonder how you feel about them. That, God, they know you're the apple. They are the apple of your eye, God, that your love and affection reaches them wherever they are, and that, God, your arm is mighty to save. And I pray that, God, in this next year, as your children and as the people of God, there would be a holy discontent that, Father, we, God, I'm so grateful for the prayer room for downtown where we stand and we say to the city, we say to the atmosphere, we prophesy to the world around us, this is truth. This is our God. God. This is what we believe. And we speak the truth of God out into the atmosphere. And we believe our words are powerful. So God, break our hearts for, for what breaks yours. Fill us with a zeal for prayer, a passion to see you move in our city, move in our circumstances, and move in our families. We believe the church's best days are not behind us, God. You said the gates of hell would never prevail against the people of God. So we ask you, Lord, fill us with new faith, new zeal, new passion for the things of God. And Father, for every person who's struggling with guilt or shame, Father, let the truth that there's no condemnation in Christ, but we've been set free from the law of sin and death by the law of love in Christ Jesus be a reality in every single heart. We look to you. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.